Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much for, again, whose we are in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, for the blessed spirit who dwells within every believer gathered here today. Uh, he is the author of the scriptures, the author of your word. And so we have the author living inside of us to give us understanding and, and uh, to open our minds to the truths of your word. And then, Father, it's going to be up to us uh, to look for ways to apply your word in our lives today. I pray that we will all be more than hearers only, but rather we'll all be doers of your word today. So have your way with us, Lord. Help us to be attentive to you, your word, your leading today. We'll give you all the thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's uh, turn in our Bibles to the, the book of 1 John today. 1 John, we're coming into chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at the first five verses today. And as we have been in the practice of doing over the last few weeks, let's again, if you're able, let's stand together uh, in honor of the Lord and his word as we look at it, as we read it here today. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Stand together if you would, please. Beginning in verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. May God add to the hearing by blessing his word today. You may be seated. As we, uh, as we move now into... Uh, chapter 5 in our study of 1 John this morning, we're going to see some birthmarks of a believer. Some birthmarks of a believer. Now, I realize that we're all Bible students here today, some of us, some of us even Bible scholars here today, and so it's no news flash for me to remind you this morning that the Bible speaks of two kinds of birth. Two kinds of birth. There is the physical birth, which I would venture to say that we've all e experienced, right? And then secondly, there is the spiritual birth or the new birth. Now, the, the Apostle John, I believe, is an expert when it comes to speaking on the new birth. How can we ever forget those words of our Lord Jesus that are recorded for us by John in his gospel in chapter 3? When Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be, what? Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. John tells us here that according to, to Jesus himself, the only way that you and I are ever going to get to heaven when we leave this life and world is by being born again. He made that so crystal clear and plain to understand. And yet there are so many people today and down through the ages that have balked and they have protested at this very clear biblical truth. You must be born again. Well, at any rate, we all know that there are definite physical characteristics and traits that make it very evident that we are part of our respective families, whether it's your nose uh, or your eyes or, or maybe the way you walk or the way you talk. Maybe it's your smile, whatever it might be. But did you know that there are also some spiritual birthmarks? That, that really set us apart from all those who are not part of God's family. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. In these first five verses of chapter 5, John gives us three very distinct birthmarks of a born-again believer. And I believe three ways that you and I can know for sure that we are true and genuine believers in Christ, that we are definitely a part of God's 
family because we're going to see these traits and characteristics, these, these birthmarks in, in our lives. You have your, the outline in your bulletin, and I invite you to follow along, along with your copy of the scriptures today. But the first uh, birthmark of a believer we see in verse 1 is an appreciation of God's children. An appreciation of God's children. John says in verse 1, he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that is God, everyone that loveth him, that begot, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. Now, this verse, this verse 1, can be divided into two distinct characteristics, two distinct traits of a true child of God. The first one is this, that God's children, those who are truly saved, those who are genuinely born again, those who are truly the, the children of God, we will love the Father. God's children love the Father. You see, the true child of God loves his heavenly Father, amen? Amen. We, we saw John reminded us actually the last couple weeks that we love him because what? He, he first loved us. I, I love that verse, but I love this one even better. In Galatians 4, verse 6, the apostle Paul says this. He says that because ye are sons of, and daughters, uh, because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. That literally is saying, Daddy Father. Daddy Father. And, and next to the name of God, Emmanuel, which means God with us, this is the second most intimate and personal uh, loving name that we have of our, of our Father in heaven. Daddy Father. Abba Father. My friends, it, it's, it's such a normal and, and a natural thing for God's children to love their Heavenly Father. And, and you know, the more that we come to know about God, and the more that we come to realize and understand all that God has done for us, the more we're going to love him, amen? You know, the more that I consider Calvary and the ultimate sacrifice that was made there at that cross for me, it was for me, it was for you. And the more I realize how much our Heavenly Father sacrificed by sending His only begotten Son to pay the price for, for our sins, yours and mine. The more I love Him, the more I love Him. And so the first trait is this, that God's children love the Father. But secondly, God's children love the family. God's children love the family. Now, way back yonder, again, when you were born physically, you were born into a family with a mother and a father. Maybe some of you had some brothers and sisters as well. And when you're born again, when you're born into God's family, you also have brothers and sisters. And again, let me say that it's the, the normal and natural thing for, for you and I who have been adopted into God's family to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you, you remember what I've been saying to the, the last couple of weeks? That True love, true love in the family of God is going to be a lot more than those three little words, I love you. Love is an action. Remember what I said last week? Love is a doing thing. You see, we prove our love one for another, not by what we say, but by what we do. So how should Christian love be evidenced here in our little church family? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 26 is a good place to start. Listen to this. Paul says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. May I ask you today, do you have a genuine love and care and concern for everybody here at Eastside, especially those that are hurting right now? You know, one of the reasons that I started uh, and I started this back when we were uh, booted out of church by the governor back in March. Uh, but I started uh, providing uh, the prayer list to every one of you, every one of our church family, each and every week. And one of the reasons I 
that I'm doing that and, and continuing to do that in the, in the bulletin each week, uh, for those of you that are here, and, and I'm mailing, for those that aren't here, I'm mailing bulletins out to them. So one of the reasons is so that we'd be praying for one another. But, you know, secondly, uh, if you see those that are hurting, those that have needs, that maybe we can do more than pray, that maybe we can do something to show our love for them. It could be something as simple as a phone call or a text or a card or a note, uh, maybe providing, offering to provide a meal. Or I mean, there's limitless of what we can do to show and to prove our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember my exhortation again last week, what are you doing to prove your love to them? So that might be one way to start. But if you really want to get a good read on the genuineness of your love for the brethren, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, pay, pay a visit sometime and, and many times to 1 Corinthians 13. That's known as the great love chapter of the Bible. And, and from time to time, take a visit there to 1 Corinthians 13 and see how your love, and I'll see how my love, measures up to what God expects from his family. Well, there's a second birthmark of a believer, not only an appreciation of God's children, but secondly, secondly, we're also going to see an application of God's commandments. An application of God's commandments in our lives. In, in verses 2 and 3, we're, we're told twice that those who are the, the true children of God will keep God's commandments. We will be obedient to our Father in heaven. Look at verses 2 and 3. Uh, John says this, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now again, with, with respect to this particular birthmark of a believer, there are two additional traits, two additional characteristics that the child of God is going to show forth. First, if, if we're truly saved... If we're truly saved, we're going to have a desire, a desire to keep God's commandments. Now, now back in the Old Testament times, uh, the commandments of God were imposed uh, upon the people of Israel as a matter of strict duty. Uh, they were required to obey God and to obey his commandments. For the Jew... Um, their religion was largely a matter of external duty and responsibility. But friends, when love comes into the picture, knowing the love that God has for you and knowing you love God in return, one's duty to obey God's law is now transformed into a desire to do so. When you meet Jesus Christ, and you are born into his family, God's family, because you love him, you desire to obey him. It's no longer duty. It's now the desire of our heart. When the Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, folks, that's no duty for the believer in Christ. That's no duty for the children of God. It's the desire of our heart to do so because you love your father, right? I admit to you this morning, I'm confessing past sins, but even though the Lord's already washed them away. But before I came to salvation in Jesus Christ, I was 27 years old when I was saved. But before that, throughout my teenage years, throughout most of my 20s, uh, you couldn't find another person with a fouler mouth than Randy Panabaker. Uh, it was just my mode of operation. <laughs> uh, I, every other word was a curse word, especially using the Lord's name in vain. Did it all the time. It was, it was habitual with me. Did it without even thinking about it. And I have to tell you, and I say this is true to you folks this morning, that the very day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, March 18th, 1979, that very day, since that very day, I had never uttered the name of the Lord in vain. That was one thing 
and, and Sue can verify that. She's lived with me for 36 years, and she's never heard me utter the Lord's name in vain. And none of you have. That was one of the things I believe God did for me instantaneous, just to give me the confirmation that day that I was a new creation in Christ, that I had been saved, I had been reborn. A brand new heart, brand new mind. When the Bible says, forsake not to gather yourselves together, folks, that's no duty for the true child of God. It's your desire as a child of the Father to, to be here as often as you can in God's house on the Lord's day because you love him, right? It's the desire of our hearts to obey him. But it's also the delight of our life, is it not? It's not only the desire of our heart to obey him, but it's also our delight to do so because we know it gives him great delight in us. John says at the end of verse 3, he says, His commandments are not grievous to the true child of God. His commandments are not burdensome. They, they're not going to weigh us down. They're not too heavy for us to bear. But rather, it becomes our delight to do the will of the Father. Now, it's only when we have a, a misunderstanding of the commandments of God that makes them seem burdensome to, to us uh, you see, God doesn't give his commandments to make us miserable. Uh, he doesn't give us those commandments to rob us of the joy in, in our lives. No, the commandments of God are given out of his love and care and concern for us. He wants what's best for us. And he gives us those commandments out of his love for us. Just, just think of the, the little boy whose father says to him, now, now Johnny, don't, don't touch that stove. It's very, very hot. See, if little Johnny puts his hand on that stove, he's going to get a very severe burn. And so the father issues this command, thou shalt not touch the stove. Now, folks, what motivated that dad to give such a stern command? Was it his desire to, to make Johnny's life miserable? Uh, to take all the fun out of Johnny's life? No, of course not. Dad's desire, his desire was to protect Johnny from injury. Why? Because of his love. Because of his love for his son. And so when we understand that the commandments of our Heavenly Father are a reflection of his love and his care and his concern for us, the greatest desire of our hearts will be to keep those commandments. Our heart's delight will be to obey the Father. Don't you love that? What are the birthmarks of a believer? First of all, an appreciation of God's children. Secondly, an application of God's commandments. Third this morning, an appropriation of God's conquest. An appropriation of God's conquest. You say, say what? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Look at the verses. Verses 4 and 5. John says this. He says, for, for whatsoever is born of God. In other words, born again believers. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't know if you noticed there and if you counted, but three times John uses the word overcometh, which reminds us that we are in a definite conflict throughout, throughout all of our lives as believers in Christ. The Bible says that we fight, as believers in Christ, we fight against three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. So we're in a conflict. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The Bible also says that we as children of God, as believers in Christ, we can experience overcoming, conquest, and victory. That's why there are folks, there is no excuse for being a defeated Christian. 
If you're a born again child of God, everything you need for living the victorious life is yours and mine. It belongs to us. Now this victory, that this conquest that is ours in Jesus Christ, again, is a twofold thing. First of all, there is the initial conquest that occurred 2,000 years ago when, when Jesus came to this earth to conquer sin, death, and hell for us. I, I, I love what Jesus says, again, in John's Gospel, in chapter 16, verse 33. He says, in this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Folks, Christ won the victory for us. You know, Satan, back in that day, Satan and all his evil forces of this world, they moved out the heavy artillery and they were blasting the Lord Jesus Christ. He was put on a cross and unleashed by the enemy, by Satan himself, unleashed was his greatest weapon. You know what that weapon was? The power of death upon Jesus Christ. And Jesus died. But when the dust cleared, and praise God, when light dawned three days later, there was the empty tomb. And the Lord Jesus Christ, with the keys of death, hell, and the grave, ascended to the Father and has become our conquering Redeemer. That was the initial conquest, but it gets even better than that. There's also a continual conquest. In other words, because Jesus Christ overcame and he's living inside of us, we too overcome. We overcome. The potential for victory over every obstacle that the world puts our way or in front of us uh, is yours. The potential for victory over every weakness of the flesh is yours. The potential for victory over every snare of the devil is yours. Let me read just a couple passages. You have them noted there in your outline. You can Check them out, meditate on these later on, perhaps today or this week. But the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.37 that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Folks, did you hear that? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I mean, it'd be one thing to be conquerors, but Paul says we are more than conquerors. I don't know what that looks like, but I like it. He said in 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. The key word there in that verse is the word always. Thanks be unto God, which always, always causes us to triumph in Christ. And then again, the third verse, 1 Corinthians 15.57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how are we as, as born-again believers in Christ, how are we going to get this victory? How are we going to realize this victory in our lives? Well, John says in verse 4, in our text today, verse 4, he says, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what? What's the word? Faith, even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Folks, faith is the switch that turns on the power of God in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 11, many of you are familiar with this chapter. This is called, commonly called the, uh, the Hall of Faith. Hebrews chapter 11. We read about uh, so many of the great heroes of the faith, the great men and women of God in Old Testament times and, and their accomplishments. We read about Enoch and, and Noah, uh, Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Rahab, and, and all the other heroes of the faith. 
Now, how did they do all the great things that they did for God? In every case, the Bible says, by faith, by faith, by faith, <laughs> by faith. My friends, it's by faith that we claim all that Jesus has done for us and all that Jesus has for us, including the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. Someone should say amen. Amen. Let me just wrap this up with a, an illustration. After the Civil War, there was a, a poor beggar uh, who went about everywhere, not only begging, but bragging that he had a piece of paper with Abraham Lincoln's signature on it. This poor man didn't have anything by way of possessions except the tattered clothes that he had on his back and this piece of paper that had Abraham Lincoln's name on it. There was a point in time where he was just about ready to starve to death. He was that destitute, but he still made this claim, I have Abraham Lincoln's name on a piece of paper. Well, there was a man that came along and says, I, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe you have, I mean, look at you, I don't believe you have anything with Abraham Lincoln's name on it. And the poor beggar said, well, yes, I do. Here, let me show you. And he, he reached into his grimy jacket, in, into his pocket, and he pulled out this wrinkled, dirty, stained piece of paper. The other man took it and unfolded it, looked at it, and said, man, do you realize what you have here? You do have Abraham Lincoln's name on this piece of paper. Abraham Lincoln has given you a very generous pension. He's made you rich. <laughs> and you're living like a pauper. All you have to do is redeem this claim and you'll be rich. My brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus has made us rich. Claim it by faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And that victory is yours. It's mine. Let's claim it. Amen? Let's live it by faith. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word and, and all that you have spoken to us and, and taught us here today. You've shown us this morning some of the birthmarks that we all have as members of your family. You've given us an appreciation for one another that motivates us to, to prove our love one to another, not by what we say, but by what we do. You've given us both the desire and the delight to obey your commandments. And Lord, besides all these things, you've given us everything we need to live the victorious life. In Christ, your Son, we have the potential for victory over every obstacle the world puts before us. In Christ, your Son, we have the potential for victory over every weakness of the flesh. In Christ, your Son, we have the potential for victory over every snare of the devil. Truly, we who are in Christ know that there is victory in Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for all these things. Our Daddy Father... Abba, Father, all these things and so much more. We pray these things with thanksgiving in our hearts and love because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I hope, I pray, I trust you'll have a blessed rest of the Lord's day and a great week. God bless you all.